Welcome, everybody. This is How to English Teach and Learn with Gavin M. It's a podcast about teaching and learning English as a foreign language. All opinions stated are personal, and references will be given when necessary. Hey, Gav. Hi, Em. How's it going? It's going well, and I'm doing good. Yeah. You? Well, I'm I'm fine too, thank you. What's new? Well, we have an absolutely amazing guest on today's show. We have some fabulous music that I know everybody is going to love. Good, yeah. And we've got a really interesting topic. Good. So, shall we jump straight in? I think we should. M. So this episode, I think we'll start with the guest because I can't wait to introduce our guest speaker on today's episode. So let me tell you about Coco Mbassi, who was born in Paris, France, and originates from Cameroon. Her music is a subtle blend of African roots, classical music, jazz and gospel, with a touch of acoustic soul music. She's the winner of several prestigious music awards and has toured worldwide with her band for over two decades. Coco has recorded four albums to date, and she recently released her first African polyphony album. Gav, can I just ask a question? Yes, M. go ahead. What is polyphony? Polyphony is when you bring together more than one musical theme or voices or sounds. Ah, I see. So the album is titled Ashuka Series Volume 1 and her first single, Palamba, came out in May 2021, which I'm really excited to say will be our song this week. That's fantastic. So we've got one of the tracks from the album. Coco also trained as a translator, interpreter and language teacher and she's finalising her PhD in social linguistics. Coco performed her first theatre role in London in 2018 and wrote her first musical titled Handel on the Estate. Extracts of the musical were performed at Oval House Theatre in London in February 2019 and she gave a full performance of the musical in 2020. Mm -hmm. Coco is now working on creating a new musical in collaboration with seasoned British author Chris Aslan Alexander. Right, let's listen to Coco's introduction now, shall we? Let's. My name is Coco Mbassi and I'm a linguist. That sounded like the introduction to the confessions of an addict, but and it's not entirely inaccurate because I am kind of addicted to languages and the study of languages, so... I was born in Paris, France and returned to Cameroon, my parents' country of origin, when I was a baby, and I lived in Cameroon and spent my formative years until the age of 14 in the capital of Cameroon, Yaoundé, spending holidays in Douala, my mother's town of origin, and Dibombari, my father's village of origin. And then I subsequently returned to Paris at the, at the age of 14, as I've mentioned, and moved to London as an adult and have now been living in London for the last 18 years. Going back to my childhood a bit, Cameroon has 260 plus languages, and I'm using the term language in the broad sense here because some of those might be classified as dialects. I'll leave you to go and research the difference between those two terms. So I grew up in a context where it was natural to speak more than one, two, three or more languages. I was a French speaker because I grew up in the French speaking part of Cameroon. And I was also an English speaker because I spoke English at home and studied in English. Cameroon inherited from colonialism French for 80% of the country and English as national official languages. Of course, the vernaculars spoken by the ethnic groups that live in Cameroon were very much alive in cities and particularly in rural areas. French and English dominated the official spheres. From education to justice, religious services, everything official, everything you can imagine. And most official documents were published in French and English, as Cameroon had the ambition of being a bilingual country, even though that reality did not percolate down to every Cameroonian. This unique linguistic context gave rise to a form of linguistic inequality because the English-speaking minority had to speak some French or at least understand some of it, while the French-speaking majority had no such obligation. 
This was broadly the reality, even though at university, some lectures were dispensed indiscriminately in either language without forewarning, and students were expected to be able to follow. So this is the context in which I grew up, with a linguist father, a professor in linguistics, in phonetics, in phonology, etc., and in English language education. I studied translation and interpreting, and I spent over a decade touring the world as a singer, songwriter, leading my own band, composing songs. I was a full-time musician, basically, and I even won some awards, and I have four albums out. In the background, I worked as a freelance translator from English to French and French to English. Yes, in both directions, because I was bilingual. I came as close as you can to being perfectly fluent in both languages. Interestingly enough, depending on whether the context I was in was majority French speaking or majority English speaking, my skills and abilities would lean towards one language rather than the other. But uh, it was this sort of oscillating balance between the two languages. I studied in both languages, alternating from one to the other, depending on the school in which I was enrolled. And later on, when I'd started my family, I moved to the UK and my touring activities sort of declined over the first five, six years in the UK. And I then reverted more to freelance translating and interpreting, even setting up my own private agency. I also taught French in the UK to adults in further education colleges. And I tried to develop methods that would make it easier for native English speakers to learn French. Even though England and France are not that distant geographically, the languages are quite different, the mindsets are different, the culture is different. And there are certain sounds in English that are particularly challenging for speakers of other languages. For example, the two THs, the soft one and the hard one, I'm not going to use um, uh, spe specialized terminology here, you understand what I mean. And the pronunciation of the R and the L, etc. To teach French well to a native English speaker, one has to innovate in order to be able to take down the barriers between the two languages. And I think that applies to English teaching in general. So the study of languages has always been at the center of my life. So in this podcast, you will have listened or you will listen to a song I composed titled Palaba. And this song is written in Cameroonian Pidgin English, which is a very interesting linguistic object. Pidgins are generally defined as contact languages. And Cameroonian Pidgin English is no exception. Cameroonian Pidgin English was born out of the pre-colonial contact between those ethnic groups that occupied the region that we now call Cameroon, and explorers, missionaries, and then colonizers coming to the region to gain mostly, to take, but also to give. So because neither spoke the other party's language, they had to figure out a way of understanding each other, of communicating. And that is how Cameroonian Pidgin English was born. It is a non-standard lingua franca. It is the language spoken in the markets. It is spoken in uh, the French-speaking and the English-speaking part of Cameroon, but it's very strong as a, a cultural symbol in the English-speaking part of Cameroon. And there are other nations of Africa that developed their own pidgin, Nigeria, Ghana, and others. Suffice it to say, in formal schooling... Our English teachers did not look favorably on us if we students ventured to utter words in pidgin on school grounds. They wanted us to speak standard English. However, as a teenager who spent primary school in an American school, then went to uh, transfer to a, a Cameroonian secondary school with a very strong southern, as in the south of the north of North America, accent, um, I had to learn pidgin English in order to survive um, and potentially to thrive because I was studying in a bilingual school and I was part of the English-speaking cohort. I had to master Pidgin English. So even though it wasn't an official language, I learned it. To be cooler, to be more accepted. Given that my father did not discriminate between languages, dialects, slang, etc., because to him everything that was uttered or written was worth studying, was worth being interested in, my whole attitude to languages was molded by my father's open mind, his linguistic open-mindedness. I am very grateful to him for that. So I ended up writing this song in Pidgin English on purpose. So here's a challenge for your listeners. Try to understand what's being said in the song. And I'm happy to provide the translation of the lyrics. So I think the love of languages and the experience of teaching language or languages is what we have in common. Coco Mbassi and Gavin, who invited me to take part in this podcast. And, of course, the listeners.
By the way, I'm not sure whether this bit will be kept in the podcast, but I wouldn't mind if it is because I must apologize. It took me um, two months, over two months to send my recording uh, to Gavin because I moved three times in the span of two months um, for various personal reasons linked to COVID and changes in my personal life. Um, But I'm grateful that I'm able to do this recording today and I hope it's interesting to the listeners. It's been a privilege uh, to share my thoughts about language with you. And I would like to conclude with one final thought. Listeners, whether you are studying English as a foreign language speaker or whether you are native English speakers learning other languages or interested in other languages, I would encourage you to go ahead, to really not hesitate to learn as many languages as possible. And also to approach speaking another language in a more forgiving way. One does not need to master every language perfectly. We're not all meant to be linguists and specialists of every single language that we speak. However, having basic vocabulary that enables us to communicate with others can help build bridges with people, can make it easier to understand where people are coming from. Learning other people's languages humanizes them to us. So that's my parting pearl of wisdom for you. Thank you very much. That was a pearl of wisdom. I agree. We should just try and communicate to see... If we can speak together and communicate, not be so precious about it and just look at the other person as a human being, I agree with Coco completely. That was wonderful. So learn as many languages as you can and learn them in a forgiving way. What do you think Coco means by that, Em? Like I say, just don't be so precious and, well, as Coco said, don't think that everything has to be perfect because it's all about communication, really. Coco's background is fascinating very interesting and varied cultures and uh, I just wonder how it makes her feel when she speaks one language or a different language whether she's had got a different personality in French or in English it's it's really interesting I think she mentioned the social differences between French English for example yeah and the mindset as well it's a lot to consider when you're learning a language And the fact that she's mastered two very different languages is a real achievement. It's amazing. I think Coco gave us a challenge, which I really love getting from our special guests. And one of the challenges she posed was, what was the difference between a dialect and a language? Now, do you know, Em? I think I know. Because it's actually not very clear. And I think maybe it depends on an individual interpretation here, but there is a broad understanding of the difference between a dialect and a language. Yeah, I always thought language was like an umbrella term for any spoken communication. Between a large, very large group of people. Yeah. Like a nation, for example. Yeah, and then under that you have different categories, perhaps, that branch off. So a dialect would be spoken by a specific group of people or in a specific area, maybe. Maybe a smaller group of people. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Because we often have, what's the collocation with dialect? No idea. Regional. Regional, yes. Sorry. Regional dialect. (laughs) Yeah. That was what I was thinking. So So if we even just think about the UK, for example, there are many regions of the UK where they're obviously speaking English, Mm. but... It might be a different English, maybe a different accent, some new words. Yeah, exactly. If I use the example of just London, you can travel a couple of miles and I would be able to understand maybe 90% of somebody's language. But there would be phrases or words that I might not recognise, but in a sentence that I would be able to understand. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think that's what I've understood to be dialect. That's what I understand too. Before we listen to the song, Gav, can we just discuss a bit more about Pidgin English? I think we should, because that is a really, really interesting topic. Pidgin English, as Coco mentioned, is the coming together of two cultures where maybe there isn't that formal classroom situation of learning the language, but maybe you're learning it as you're interacting with people from another culture, from another language. Yeah, as she mentioned, living in Cameroon where French was the dominant language, but the English speakers would need some way of communicating. So there would be this kind of pidgin language. It was interesting. She said it wasn't tolerated in Mm. the schools to speak in that way. So, yeah, there's a lot of history involved in this um, song, Palaba. 
Have you seen the lyrics to the the song that Coco's provided? I have got the lyrics. And yes. it's amazing because it's actually provided in two forms. So it's in the Pidgin English and then in the standard EFL English that we teach to our students. And I got maybe half of it right, I think, before I looked at what the actual lyrics were. That's amazing because even from the title, I completely misunderstood and I was Googling, what does palava mean? And mm. then Coco informed me, well, it's palava, as in, what a palava? What does that mean? I'll tell you, Gav. Palava is a long and confusing process or procedure. I know that. <laughs> okay. It's a prolonged and tedious fuss or discussion. Yeah, it doesn't have to be just a discussion. It can be a situation or an event or... Yeah, a fuss. Yes. It's another really fun challenge to try to guess the pigeon English. So Gav, put the song on. Let's have a listen. And what are we listening for? What's our, our task this time, Em? Well, let's try and work out what Coco's singing about in a very broad way. So what I'll do, Em, is I will post the lyrics to Palava, Coco's song... And I'll also share the standard translation to Palava, and people can compare the Cameroon Pidgin English to the standard English and see what you think. Great idea. Stop the podcast right now, download the lyrics from the show notes, and you can follow the lyrics while you listen to the song. Time where I turn up some morning, I did follow walk oh. I did say my prayer, I did walk chop for picking them. Every day na palava, all right being thrown. I say upside to wrong, but thank God I tight it. I know I'm a palava. I know get power for him. What I go do? I know fit fight with you. Now this prayer away, it give me power. Because in a papa God he carry me oh. I know say I go make him. I want turn for left. Na pala body wait for me. I want turn for right. Mo pala body wait for me. I no want me pala ba. I no get power for him. What I go do? I no fit fight with you. I no want me pala ba. I no get power for him. What I go do? I no fit fight with you. Mhm. Eh eh. Now wait I never am so. No balaba. Time we are come out for house. Say make I forget balaba. Why be said time we are return? You de wait for me with palaba. Hey, I said, no palaba. Time we are come out for household. Say make I forget palaba. Why be said time we are return? You de still wait for me with palaba. Hey, hey, I said, no palaba. No, 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 I said, I said, left arm so. No palaba. I no want palaba. Leave me in peace, oh. Eh, left arm so. No palaba. Time we are come out for house, oh. Say make I forget palaba. No palaba. Why be say time we are return? You no feel leave me in peace, oh. Eh. I don't want palaver. 
da 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 Great song. Beautiful. I really enjoyed that. Music's amazing and the words fit really well. Coco's voice is delightful. Yeah. It's so rich and melodic. It's just captivating. And it was really interesting to hear the pidgin English and identify the words. So I was looking a little bit into pidgin English Mm -hmm. and what all pidgins have in common when we're talking about pidgin English is this uncomplicated way of constructing sentences Mm -hmm. without very long sounds, mostly short-sounding words. The tenses are quite simple. Where did you get all this from? Wikipedia. Good. There's not a lot of classification necessary to describe the words, like when you're talking about the nouns and all the adjectives. There's not a lot of focus on conjugations, that kind of thing. So that is something that is common across all pigeons. Which is interesting, I think. That's fascinating. Well, again, that makes sense that it's about communication. It's not about accuracy other than to correctly share information, knowledge, etc. Yeah, I would actually, I would probably disagree with the word correctly because I just don't know if there's even that emphasis on it. Well, I mean, correctly as in you say, I want two of those and they give you two of those. That's really what you want. You mean getting the idea across. Looking at the song, the um, Palaba song, you can see that. I think you can see those elements there. Mm -hmm. Give me an example. And what what have you seen? So like, every day na Palaba. Instead of every day there is trouble, I think it's a shorter way to say the same thing. Looking a bit more at Pidgin English, there are... A lot of them, Gav. Did you know that? A lot of pidgin Englishes? Yes. If that's plural of English is Englishes, I guess. Um, Yeah, there's Aboriginal pidgin English, Native American, Chinese pidgin English, Japanese, Hawaiian, something like Butler English, which was from India. It's, It's worldwide Samoan, Thai, and there's also European EU English. Did you know about that? Is there really? Yeah, and I... Yeah, I went down a bit of a rabbit hole, Gav, looking at EU English, Mm -hmm. which I had heard of before. Have you heard of it? I hadn't, but I did know there was an international English. Maybe it's in some way connected. Yeah, it is, kind of. It's sort of accepted English at uh, EU conventions, conferences. It's sometimes called continental English, which is... When I look at it, actually, I realise that most of my European students who are learning English are what I would think of as making these mistakes, but they're not actually mistakes now. They're accepted as official European English. Right. And I'll give you some examples for, um, like, the first one, I think we've mentioned before on this podcast, the difference between this actual document and this current document. Uh Well, actual is accepted as being current. Okay. And there are also things like, I'm coming from Spain is fine, instead of I come from Spain. Wow. Maybe you would say there were two people at the party, but EU English... Can I guess? What? Two persons? No, actually, oh. not that. We were two people. Oh, really? Yeah, we were two oh. people at the party. I get that a lot with my students. I do too, yeah. Uh, let me give you some more examples that I know that you've mentioned as well. How do you call it? How is it called? Oh. Instead of what do you call it and what's it called? Right. Just the other day I was telling my students, you don't control documents, you can't control paper, you no. can only control people or countries or things what do you do with those documents i would say check them Uh aha but i'm starting to think it's fine because eu english eu pigeon english 
you can control it. Mm, it's fine. That's good. He's in his cabinet is fine instead of he is in his office. Oh. And the big... Um, it's not third person S, is it? <laughs> yeah, third person S. Who needs it? We all understand what it means. It's abandoned in the EU. Pretty much not used. So you can just say... He want, she want, they want. Oh, no, that's right. <laughs> And the sticking point I always have is informations is okay. Oh, it's become countable again. It has. Oh, this takes me back to our last episode where we were all over the shop with these rules. Yeah, which I think just highlights how English is evolving and we shouldn't stick to these things or hold on to them and not let them go because it changes. I think it's wonderful. I love the way that English is so versatile, it absorbs other languages, and is so popular. Yeah, we should embrace it, this simplification as well. I think I've, I've always said to my students, don't make it overly complicated. Just try and express yourself and say what it is you're trying to say without all the, the frills and the flowers. And I think that's the way that some of these pigeons go, is just re- reducing things into concepts and ideas. Mm-hmm which should be really the focus of, of a language, in my opinion. I agree. Em, remember you were talking about Coco's story, where she couldn't use pidgin English in the classroom and instead had to use standard French or English? Yeah, in Cameroon, you mean. That's yeah. right. Well, it reminds me of a story I read recently in The Guardian, which was where a London school has tried to ban its students from using slang in the classroom, especially in their essay writing. Mm, Slang such as what? Especially starting sentences with words like basically or um, because, like, uh, you see... So it's a bit like how you would speak. The students are writing in their essays how they would speak to each other. And these are kind of filler words. So there were others such as... Oh my days and other expressions that are very idiomatic. Mm, I think I saw this article. It was something about he cut his eyes at me, which means like he gave me a a dirty look or... Yeah, to cuss somebody. Yeah. So this is really interesting. And it's it's interesting. It makes the news, Mm. uh, the national news. Yeah. And this is always, I think it's always going to be a hot topic. And it's definitely in language learning going to be a hot topic. Just where that line is and when does a word become acceptable that, you know, some people consider to be slang. Because I'm sure a lot of the words we're using now used to be slang, but mm-hmm. they've been accepted. So yeah. there's a good argument, I think. That... And interestingly, the linguists are actually supporting this new language and calling the ban a crude and short-sighted disservice and discredit to young people. Mm, interesting, isn't it? What's your opinion? I'm a bit split on it, to be honest. I am a bit old-fashioned and I think essay writing should use standard English, whatever that is. Mm. But then, of course, we need to introduce new language. We need to develop and include the words that young people are using to express themselves. So it's a tricky one for me. Yeah, I think it is tricky. And I think banning, the word banning, you know, these words are banned. (laughs) Of course, it's not going to be effective because, well, it it may be effective, but the kids are just going to be angry about it. Yeah, You know, there's this hard rule that they can't use these words and these words are their their language. It's the words they use all the time. Mm. So I'm not sure if that's the right way to go with it, really. No, I would love to see that list because I I should probably learn all of those words so that I can talk to young people now. Uh, Yeah, yeah, you need to update your English, find out what all these new phrases are, definitely. So I hope this has been interesting for everyone and maybe just a bit of reflection on what kind of language you use and if there's any other pidgin English that you know about. Mm -hmm. Maybe in your country. We'd love to know more if there is. Yeah, I've really enjoyed it, Gav. I found it really, really interesting. And I think Coco's contribution and learning all about her history, her background, her experiences, and also because she's working as a teacher and linguist, 
So we have some things in common, which is wonderful. And also her song was just magical. And we're so proud that we were able to share it with everybody listening to the show. Yeah, it kind of brought everything together, didn't it? It was lovely. Um, have we got time to do some quick shout outs? I think we can squeeze some in, Gav. Ready? I'll go first. English.with.stories. English with Mary dot official. Stella underscore translation underscore learn. Tang Ning underscore in the picture. English dot with dot Islami. English underscore with underscore us. English underscore speaking underscore success. English teacher 4848. Farhad underscore 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 546. Best bumper. And sorry, best bumper, but we are speaking very quickly. Um, but don't forget, you can get the transcription of our shows from our website. Carrying on with the shout outs. English underscore with underscore Brent. English dot Esan. A cup of English. E N G L I I S H. Idiom underscore underscore land. Profi English. Ranji.tutor58 Roshanak underscore English underscore English dot with dot Sadre and Dishe English number four dot ever English with Massey with three S's V Love English And finally Natalia Fedorova 547 Thank you Natalia Thanks everybody Also find us on YouTube Hashtag how to English pod and you can join Gavin M and listening and viewing our photo as you enjoy the show. So there's no excuses, everyone. Keep following. It's everywhere. We are everywhere. Thanks, Em. Thanks, Gav. And thank you especially to Coco and Bassi. You can support the CD version of Coco's latest album on PayPal. I'll put the links in the show notes. And also, please visit her website, which is cocoambassy.co.uk. Thank you so much to her. And thank you, everybody, for listening. We really enjoyed today's show. See you next time, Em. Bye, Gav. Bye. Bye.